All right, everybody, welcome back to the show. We're here once again with our Cabral host calls. This is our second host call of the weekend, answering our community's questions, just as we do every Saturday and Sunday, essentially live. I just open up the Word document that my team puts together for me, although, of course, it's a pages document because I'm all Mac and all Apple all the time. Keep things simple, keep things easy. Uh, but all joking aside, what I'd love to be able to do is essentially as if we were to bump into each other at something like the Reimagine Health Summit, and you were to ask me your question, and I would say, hey, based on 25 plus years experience, hundreds of thousands of labs run, this is what I would recommend in terms of getting started. So not providing medical advice, medical treatment plans, medical cures, medical diagnosis, love being able to answer all of your questions, especially since we've done now over a quarter of a million client appointments, and I wanna share some of that with you. So the first question today, just open it up right now, this is episode 3159, so if you want to follow along with the questions, you can go to stephencabral.com slash 3159. None of the questions are ever edited. Okay, so first one's from Melissa. Hi, Dr. Brawl. On my food sensitivity test call, the coach said that there would be a concern if a person didn't have any immune reactions to food because food is a foreign invader to the body. I see what she's saying to a certain extent, but this was confusing to me because I thought the point of taking the test was to figure out if, if you have sensitivities and remove them for a certain period of time and then reintroduce them to see if you're still sensitive. The goal being to remove a negative immune reaction and reduce the stress in your body. Maybe I was mis misunderstanding what she was trying to say, but this sounds counterintuitive to me. Can you please explain, could the sensitivities be affecting the IgG part of your immune system in which we wouldn't want you to remove them? Okay, I get it. I understand. So I don't know if you worked with an integrative health practitioner, an equal life health coach, naturopathic doctor, someone, but either way, it's all good. And they were trying to explain it to you in the proper way. No doubt about that. And I think you actually wrote in yesterday as well. Different question though. So no problem at all. So here's the thing. This is looking at a delayed reaction, immunoglobulin G. And for everybody, if you don't know what food sensitivity testing is, or if you have a lot of questions around it, I did a whole show on this last week or this past week, uh, on Wednesday, I think, episode 3155. So I answered this question and many more, but I want to answer this for you, Melissa. So when you put a food into your body, it is true that it is foreign. I wouldn't call it an invader. It's just not self, right? It's not self. It's not you. So your body typically has a normal immune reaction. That's why when you look at a food sensitivity test, there is a green zone. That means totally normal. Yellow, mild reaction. Orange, moderate reaction. Red, high reaction. If you're in the green, totally normal reaction. The only time this is an issue is when we see people, and this is based on our practice. So like, I'm, I'm proud to say this. I hate to say it because I don't like to, you know, like pin metals to our chest or anything. We run more labs, at-home functional medicine lab tests than basically anyone in the industry. We've run over a half a million labs, like from a true functional medicine, integrative health perspective. And we see things at a greater level data-wise than a lot of people. And one thing that we've noticed is that when someone runs a food sensitivity test and they're the little circle that denotes their score is all the way pinned against the left side and they're not having any reaction, we say, wow, this looks like potentially no diagnosis, no medical diagnosis, medical treatment plans, medical cures, or medical advice of any way. Uh, this looks like someone, based on all of our experience, that might have an autoimmune issue because their immune system is not showing up in this IgG regard. So there seems like there's a little bit of a depressed immune function here. However, if I remember from your question yesterday, you would like four or five food sensitivities, which means that you do not have most likely, again, no medical diagnosis, a suppressed immune function. So um, it is probably just a normal food sensitivity test with someone that has a few food sensitivities. So hopefully that helped. And then, yes, when you reduce a food in your diet, as long as you clean up the gut, there's less inflammation, less your immune system is seeing it, and it can decrease the sensitivity. But as I've shared before, all my food sensitivities have gone away. I used to have over 30 when I was 19. I tested for these. Um, but the only ones that remain to this day are almonds and kidney beans. 
So sometimes, even though I don't eat those foods, it remains a sensitivity. Okay, so hopefully that's helpful. All right, up next is Delaney. Oh, pronounced Delaney. Thank you for, I love when people give me the phonetic pronunciation so I can actually, because uh, I like to be able to pronounce people's names correctly. People refer to me all the time as Stefan or Stephen because it's Stephen with a PH. But that's okay. I understand. They're just trying to say it phonetically. All right. So it says, Hi, Dr. Brawl. Thanks for all the knowledge and for information you share. I'm a registered nurse hoping to make the jump to IHP soon. Well, Delaney, we would love to have you in the IHP community. We have hundreds of nurses in the IHP community out of the 5,000 uh, IHPs we have. So it says, My son is 13 months old, and he's already been on antibiotics three times. Once for a fever of unknown origin at 50 days old and two other for air infections. I know you and your coaches don't see kids until three years old. Are there any tips you have for kids under three to rebuild gut microbiome because of these antibiotics and any suggestions of what to do instead to avoid them in the future? Okay, so yes. Um, I don't know if you were uh, breastfeeding your child or not. That is obviously a personal decision and totally up to you. I pass. No judgment either way. But as a practitioner, I have to know. And that's simply because you would be making antibodies for your baby and passing those on through breastfeeding. Now, if you weren't doing that because you had to go to work or whatever it might be, totally get it. And so they wouldn't obviously have the benefit of those specific antibodies. I mean, the human body is absolutely amazing. When a child nurses from their mother, they actually, the mother will begin to make the antibodies that their body needs. So it's absolutely amazing. Now, having said that, when antibiotics are needed in life-saving conditions, antibiotics are needed. So as a registered nurse, I'm sure you made the right decision. So, it, you know, you good. I mean, good on you and no doubt about it. I believe you for sure. So now what do we do though? Okay, well, what we need to do is to make sure that there's not then yeast overgrowth or bacterial overgrowth, which can happen after antibiotic use. So what we could do is we can mix a little bit of the clean gut probiotic. So that's over at stephencabral.com slash shop. Again, this is not medical advice, medical treatment plans, medical cures, or medical diagnosis. We take that and we put it into the milk or water, whatever it might be, just a half a capsule. That's it. Not full, half a capsule. And that's kind of just consumed as a child consumes it or not. Has Saccharomyces boulardii, has some good probiotics, but only half a capsule. Serving sign is typically two. We're only, again, <laughs> using half a capsule. At the most, you can start with a quarter of a capsule if you want. Okay, so I'm oftentimes for children also adding a probiotic called l ruteri. That is absolutely... Um, to a greater degree in our daily probiotic, but you can use that as drops for your child as well. Okay, what else? If we needed to, which we don't use, like I said, until two, three years old, is a product, because we can't use citricidal with kids, called um, biocidin. That's again at stephencabral.com slash shop. And we'll just use one drop in water to start, but a small amount because we want them to consume the whole thing. And then we'll work up to potentially three drops maximum for a child under three. And that can help with any overgrowth in the gut. And we'll just do that for like two to three weeks. So yeah, that's where we'll start. And then we could use a sheep or goat-based yogurt or a coconut yogurt if there's no sensitivity as they start to eat some foods. Uh, we could use some fermented veggies as they start to do some food and to introduce what else can we do here because i want to help you know like that's the goal and yeah i think those are some good tips to get started so hopefully that's helpful all right jackie's up next jackie says hi dr brawl thank you for all you do your team and the work you have been life-changing for me thank you jackie appreciate that i struggle with garlic and onions they cause me to burp and have gas for 48 hours. I also take three to four days for me to stop stinking, even with daily sauna and cardio. It's very unpleasant. I don't eat them unless at family or friends or out of my direct control as a common cooking ingredient. Is there anything I can do to help with for digestion? For context, I did the big five with no food intolerances other than eggs or Brazil nuts. 
I did a 21-day detox, heavy metal detox, CBO protocol and finisher, and a then did a functional medicine detox for seven days. I also ran allergy tests and nothing came back. I take HCL and digestive enzymes with meals to support digestion. Would love your insights. Happy to help with this. All right. So believe it or not, I too cannot eat garlic. Now, I can have some garlic powder and I can have onions, but I can't have raw garlic. It gives me, I always tell my wife, I was like, there is, and she knows too, I can eat anything and I never get any bloating, any cramping, and any gas. My stomach is like a steel trap. It's, it's crazy. Nothing ever happens no matter what I eat. If I eat garlic, it's almost like the world is collapsing down on me. I get cramping. I get bloating. I feel terrible. So, of course, I've looked into this. Some And it doesn't show up my food sensitivity test either. And that's because it's looking at, remember, a protein-based reaction. I talk about that in episode 3155. So, what is it? Some people lack the enzyme to properly break down allium. Now, I don't know why onion does not affect me in this way. If I ate a ton of it, yes, it does. But a small amount, no big deal. Garlic, even just a half a clove chopped up, does a number on my stomach. A little garlic powder, it's minced to almost nothing. It's basically processed. So the more you process it, the easier it is to digest. The more it is in its whole form, well, what do you need? You need more enzymes to break it down. So again, I can't give you a diagnosis. But some people have, again, it's just labeled allium intolerance. So high allium foods, garlic, onions, shallots, etc., they don't do well with. I stay away from garlic. Is it a healthy food? Can it kill parasites? All these things? Yes. Does not work for me. However, I can take aged garlic extract. And that can be beneficial if you would like to get some garlic in. It's not going to help with the parasites and those types of things. But what can I do for parasites if I want? I can do papaya seeds, non-GMO, of course. I can do pumpkin seeds. I can do other things. So it's not always like you need to eat garlic. No, garlic's a very healthy food. However, not for me. Maybe not for you. So hopefully this was helpful. All right, Hannah's up next. Hi, Dr. Rawl. You're so amazing. Thanks for all you do. Thank you, Hannah. Appreciate that. It says, I probably have some insulin resistance, years of a high carb and processed diet, uh, gestational diabetes, sorry, GD. It's, it's late in the day. <laughs> I've got to get all my terminology down. GD during uh, pregnancy failed by two points, obviously. So just a small amount, uh, meaning like it does matter. I'll talk about that in a moment. Tinnitus um, acquired during the third trimester. Since the tinnitus started, I've been determined to turn my health around for me and my family. I tried to do a 36-hour water fast and became tachycardic. Blood glucose was at 44, so basically 44 uh, when you look at the specific units produced. Usually you want to be between, be between 70 and 90. After 35 hours, and I had to eat something. I'm 4'11", 96 pounds. Any advice with how to fast while dealing with hypoglycemia? Okay, yes. So it's funny because sometimes I match up with these things. I am now able to fast, but I did not used to be able to many years ago because I had hypoglycemia. Now when I fast, so keep in mind, I am someone that drops into the low 60s to high 50s blood sugar wise after about an hour and a half of waking. So why, of course, do I break my fast about an hour and a half after waking? Because there's no point in fasting beyond that because my body requires now glucose, right? And that's not a bad thing. And remember, at 4'11", 96 pounds, your liver, I've got my buddy Walter here again, your liver is not going to store as much glucose, glycogen, as someone that's 180 pounds, 200 pounds, right? N nowhere near the same amount. So you're not going to be able to store as much, but that's not the reason why. It's truthfully not. You should not be dropping down to a 44. And keep in mind, I've, I've talked to colleagues, they're like, oh, I have people drop into the high 30s for blood sugar on a, water, I'm like, on a fast. 
that's not healthy. Anything below 56 is actually quite dangerous. So I can't recommend that. Some people are willing to go into the 40s. I am not. I don't think that that's healthy for the body. It's quite a strain on the nervous system. Uh, I don't think it's a great idea. So what do we do? For you, the minimum we would do is run the stress mood and metabolism test. Ideally, I would run the big five. So stephencabal.com slash big five. That's what I would run. And it's just the number five. So, but I would absolutely, I want to see your cortisol levels. I want to see your thyroid levels. I want to see your hormones. Like we need to say, why is this person dropping into hypoglycemia? Like what is the stress state? I would love to run the minerals and metals test with you too. So ideally the vitamin tox test, which is the kidney to metabolic and vitamins test that would look at neurotransmitters, mitochondria, so much. And the, so mineral metals test, candida metabolic vitamins test, that's called the vitamin tox test together. And then the um, hormones test, if you don't want to run the big five, when the hormones test is the stress mood and metabolism. Okay. So that's what I would do. Did I get to your uh, gestational diabetes? You know, again, take this with a, a grain of salt because uh, I, I don't like to go overboard with gestational diabetes during the third trimester with like four weeks left, six weeks left for pregnancy. I think we have to be careful with over medicating. And then the tinnitus. Yeah, the tinnitus could be, uh, so I have a whole podcast on tinnitus. So it, it could be low B6, low folate. Um, it could be inflammation of the neck, uh, trigeminal area. What else could it be? It could be heavy metals. There's a lot that's going on. And that's why, again, I would run the big five if possible. So there's so much, you know, obviously we'd love to help you with and that's what I would do. I would improve the adrenals so that they're responding properly to lower blood sugar, meaning that they are, as long as you're not, well, even if, look at it this way, and I know that I'm going on and on now. Even if your liver is depleted of glycogen, your body should then be able to break down muscle tissue. Not ideal, but it breaks down muscle tissue. And it would then be able to supply you with some glucose, stored glycogen for glucose, to raise your blood sugar back up once you start getting into the low 50s. When I did my uh, extended water fast, I would drop into the low 50s all the time, and it doesn't feel good. It's not nice, but my body would bring it back up. And so, you know, I, I don't like to see that your body dropped into the 40s, and so I would not recommend extended fasting. The most you would do is 12 to 14 hours from like 6 p.m. at night to maybe 8 a.m. the next morning, which is, uh, again, I can't give any medical advice, but many people do in our practice. I use it myself, and it works really well. But you'll be able to see based on, I'm assuming you're using continuous glucose monitor, uh, when you start to drop in as well. All right, so hopefully that was helpful. That's going to do it for our questions today. I think that was another five or so for today. So once again, I appreciate you. I thank you for being a part of this community. You're all amazing. I hope to see you at the Reimagined Health Summit in just about a month or so from now, rhsevent.com. I'll see you there, and I'll be back tomorrow with a brand new Cabral concept. Take care, everybody. Thanks so much for tuning into today's show. Before you go, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. I want to make sure that you're getting our daily content, not missing out on anything. Functional medicine, wellness, weight gain, weight loss, anti-aging, living longer, stronger, and all of the most cutting edge research. And if there's any topics you want to hear, feel free to leave them in the comments below. Take care.